Hey, CSM, uh, welcome again. I'm so excited that you guys uh, are joining us this weekend for service. Uh, as I've been looking at the last few weeks, I'm just so thankful that we uh, have technology and we're able to still provide a message for you guys because if this quarantine would have happened 20 years ago, there's no telling how would we we'd be able to stay connected. We wouldn't be able to stay connected. And so I'm, I'm just thankful. And I remember back uh, being a kid, thinking that I had to do uh, a whole bunch of certain things, live a certain way or, or read the Bible a, a certain amount of time, go to a, a certain number of church events just to earn God's love. I know that's not what I was taught, but I just felt like that's what I was always trying to do, trying to earn God's love by the things that, that I was doing. Have you ever been there before? Like just thinking, man, maybe God's not here and so... I got to do more things. I got to read my Bible more just to make sure he notices me and that he loves me. This is a common thing for, for Christians. I feel like everyone in their faith journey at some point kind of struggles through this. And maybe I, I'm not doing enough. Maybe that's why my, my prayers aren't being answered. And so I, I start doing this checklist of things, reading my Bible for 10 minutes, starting another version Bible plan, going to another CSM event or another church event, just trying to, to earn God's love, trying to make sure that he's still there and that he sees us. This idea of doing things to earn love starts to take over into our personal lives. We think that we have to do certain things to, to earn that, that boy or that girl's love, to make sure that they love us, look a certain way, change our appearance just to earn love to make sure that we do things to earn our friend's love or our parents' love. I think the bottom line is that deep down inside, we all just want to be loved. And so for so much of my teen years, I just tried to please everybody. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel loved and appreciated. And whether it was my coaches or, or my teachers my friends, a girlfriend, I would do anything that I could do to make sure that I felt like they loved me. Trying to just, to earn love. When I felt like God had maybe abandoned me, I would do the same thing. Start another plan, read more, just to try and make sure that he knew that I was there, that, that he would see me. And right now we're in our summer series. This is our second week. And as Caleb taught last week and, and talked about it, we're in a people series. And so we're, we're looking at all kinds of different people throughout the Bible and, and what they did, how they did it, who they were, and trying to take their story and learn something from it and apply it to our lives. And so when I start to think about someone in the Bible who would do anything to feel loved, I think about Leah. Leah was a loyal and faithful woman, but she would do anything to earn love. She was just like us. Deep down inside, all she wanted was to feel loved. We find her story in uh, the book of Genesis chapter 29, starting in verse 15. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and, and head there now. But this story involves a few key characters. It involves Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Rachel and Leah's father, Laban. And we're going to be focusing on Leah, but there's a few details and some things that we need to know the background before we get started. So Jacob, Jacob is traveling back home or, or to where his family was. And he comes up to this well. This well was uh, the water source for all the animals in the area. The shepherds would bring all of their flocks there to water the animals. Rachel was a shepherdess. At this time, that was not common. That was seen as a man's job. It was seen as the job for the, the youngest son of the family. It was a dirty job. It was, it was gross. It was hard work. Not something that a, a necessarily a woman would be asked to do. But Rachel was a shepherd. So Rachel's at this well, and, and Jacob, this is his first encounter with seeing Rachel, and, and he fell in love. It was love at first sight. We know that in Scripture, and, 
And he would do anything because of his love, anything to earn Rachel's love, to be her husband. He was attracted to her. But also maybe he, he thought it was, it was cool that she was doing a man's job and she wasn't uh, worried about what that looked like. She was doing the gross and dirty job and he was attracted to that. So Rachel has this encounter with Jacob and she runs home to tell her father Laban about Jacob. Now, a weird thing about this story is that Laban is actually Jacob's uncle. So that makes the rest of this story kind of weird and awkward, but that is for a totally different message. Um, ask your student pastor about it. Maybe they can talk about, we're not going to go to that part of this story. But that's where we pick up is that Rachel runs home and wants Laban to meet Jacob. And so that's where we're going to pick up in Genesis 29, verse 15. It says, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. So we're introduced to Leah right here in the story, the the older daughter. The first description that we get of Leah is that she has weak eyes and that her sister Rachel is attractive and and, and beautiful, but weak eyes, like I, I don't even understand what that means. It's definitely not nice and not a way that someone would want to be described, especially not in the Bible that's been around for 2,000 years. This is what we get of Leah. She had weak eyes. Like that just throws me off a little bit. So already I can start to feel that Leah probably has some emotional discomfort in that. I mean, this is how she's described the first time we're introduced to her is is weak eyes. I, I still don't get it. But Jacob, he's in love with Rachel. So he works for seven years. Seven years. Think about that for a second. When I met my wife and I fell in love with her, there was no way I was waiting seven years to marry her. That just doesn't happen these days. You hear stories of people marrying like after a few weeks, but seven years, that's how devoted and how much he loved her that he would do seven years worth of work just to be married. So let's pick it back up in verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. Wow. (laughs) There is so much to unpack right here. And let's just start at the beginning. If you're like me, you're wondering, how in the world did Jacob not know that Leah was the girl in his room the night of his wedding? I have no idea, but you see, like, they didn't have, like, lights. There was no, like, clap on light. Like, let me just make sure this is, this is Leah in here. Like, I don't know what was going on, but I do know that Jacob had just worked for seven years, so I doubt the night of his wedding, he's like, let me make sure this is my new wife in my room. I don't know. It's crazy. But then imagine what Leah must have been feeling. 
You see, it's custom during that time that the bride would be given to her husband at night in the dark after the celebration and they would sleep together and then the marriage would be official. Maybe, maybe Leah was in on it the whole time. Maybe Rachel was in on it too. But why? What would, what would make someone do something like this? Even at like, what would, what would have to be going through your emotions and your mind to deceive someone like this? Have you guys ever seen the show Catfish? I, I've watched that show. This was the original Catfish. That's what that show's, it's, it's this story, right? Imagine what Leah must have felt that next morning. Like her husband now, right? Because of the official marriage the night before, her husband doesn't want to be with her. Her father used her. She might even have allowed her father to use her. Did she just want to be loved and would do anything to receive it? Laban tricked Jacob into being with Leah. And Jacob wakes up surprised. Yeah, of course. And imagine what that conversation must have been like around breakfast, right? So Jacob, of course, he goes and confronts Laban. And he ends up agreeing to complete seven more years of work just to get Rachel as his wife. And then he would be married to both of them. Again, I can't imagine the emotions that Leah must have been going through. Her husband doesn't want to be with her but he's going to put up with her for a week just to marry her younger sister. And then what? She's just wife B, second choice. How many of us have have felt that with our relationship with God? What does that person do differently than me that their prayers are answered? They seem like God is right there with them and, and I can't seem to feel like God is listening to me. Does God even want a relationship with me? He must love them more than he loves me. I've been there. Jealous of other people and their relationship with God. Thinking I have to do more things to earn his love. And so that's what we usually do. We start praying more. We start reading the Bible more. We start going to more events and more church things, just trying to get noticed by God. And Leah is no different. I can't put words in her mouth or know exactly what was going on in her head, but I think it's safe to say that that Leah had some jealousy at the attention and love that her sister was receiving. And we know right there that that Jacob's love for Rachel was, was greater than his love for Leah. God saw this and he gave special attention to Leah. He enabled her to have children. And Leah uses Hebrew names for her kids to express her wants and needs from Jacob. She named her first son Reuben. Reuben means to see. And maybe she thought, now maybe my husband will see me. Maybe I won't be invisible anymore. She named her second son, Simon, which has to do with hearing. Now maybe my husband will listen to me, but he didn't. She named her third son, Levi, which means to be attached. Maybe she thought like, my heart will finally be attached to my husband's and he'll love me. She just wanted to be seen to be heard, to felt loved and accepted, to be valued. I can relate. God, I love you. Do you love me? God, I talk to you in my prayer time, but why can't I hear you? God, I see and I read the truths in your word, but can you even see me where I'm at? Feeling not good enough or or, or overlooked can cause deep hurt and can turn into feelings of, of being less than, forgotten, maybe even a fear of 
of not being wanted. God saw Leah's struggle and, and her, desire, her desire to be loved. And he enabled Leah to have sons because he saw that that's what Leah needed. He saw that she was unloved. He saw the rejection that Leah had received and, and knew what having sons would mean to her. Her security and longing for love eventually turns from her husband, her human husband, to her heavenly father. He still pursues her and he loved her even when her husband didn't. We see this when Leah named her fourth son, Judah. She conceived again and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Her focus shifts. Her longing for love and wanting to be long, uh, wanted shifts from her husband to God. In the story of Leah, we see how God worked through her to bring out his will by her sons eventually making up the 12 tribes of Israel. These tribes were, were the Hebrew people who, who took over in the promised land uh, they took possession of it after Moses died. Leah and her sons were the ancestors of Jesus. She focused on the love that God had for her, a love that she did nothing to deserve, a love that she didn't have to do anything to earn. Because of this, her and her sons were the extended family of Jesus. Things aren't always as they seem. In Leah's case, she was rejected, dealt with emotions of jealousy and, and desire to just be pursued, just to be loved. What she realized was that even though her own sister, Rachel, was wanted and pursued, Rachel had her own emotions and weaknesses to deal with including jealousy and anger, and Jacob didn't fix that for her. Leah eventually found out, found what she was looking for in God, and no one could take that away. See, I don't think that God makes everything happen for a reason, but I truly believe that God will give a reason for everything that happens. And it happened for Leah. Leah. We have to remember that God's plan for our lives doesn't always end up the way that we think it should. Maybe with us being the, the star of a sports team or, or being the most popular or, or having the most followers out of our friends. We aren't promised a life without pain or struggle, but what we receive is so much more than that. The security in God's love his pursuit of us and his desire to use our lives to build his kingdom and, and, and become a story. It can become our story and so much greater than anything that we could ever imagine for ourselves. You don't have to earn God's love. And his timing is always right, even when we feel like it's not. No matter how alone or rejected you may feel, God is still working in your life and he has amazing plans for you. When you start to focus on the love that God has for you, the love that's not earned, the love that was always there and, and, and will be there forever, that's when you can, can start to truly live out the calling God has on your life. We are loved and we are invited to help build God's kingdom. Would you guys pray with me, please? God, thank you so much for your, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. God, thank you for your timing. God, even when we feel alone and, and rejected and, and we just want to be loved, God, you're always there. You've always loved us. And there's nothing we can do to earn it or deserve it, but it's there. We're so thankful for that, God. God, I pray that you would be with students 
today, God, is, is some of them are struggling just trying to be seen or heard right now. God, that you would be there with them, that you would, you would meet them in their prayer time, that you would meet them in their reading time. God, that you would be heavy on their heart, that you're right there with them. God, and you have an amazing plan for their lives. God, we thank you for all this. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen.